The following podcast is brought to you by the Jonas Podcasting Network, found exclusively at wrestlingwithjonas.com. Attention wrestling fans, you're now about to listen to the band coming down the aisle from the main streets of South Hogan, Illinois. With a microphone in his hand and questions on his mind, this is What You Say with D D J. Welcome, everyone, to episode 42 of What Do You Say with DDJ, the official season two premiere of uh, this great show, and also the debut episode of What Do You Say with DDJ, now that it is a part of the Johners Podcasting Network. Uh, I want to thank John Scott, who uh, runs the Johners Podcasting Network, for bringing me on board. And I'd also like to thank my friend John Bullard for uh, setting me up with this great opportunity for my show. Um, before I get into uh, this week's guest, I want to take a quick moment to uh, thank the uh, guys over at Pro Wrestling Junkies, uh, where I used to uh, run this show out of. I thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to uh, do this. It was a fun ride, but uh, it was time to move on, and I wish you guys nothing but the best of luck over there. Uh, now going on to uh, this week's guest. Uh, my guest this week is former WCW, former NWA, TNA, uh, former Heartland Wrestling Association superstar Alan Funk. Uh, you guys may know him as Angry Alan. Uh, he was also known as Queewee, as well as uh, in the NWA TNA, he was known as Bruce. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy the interview. Uh, just grab your drink, grab a grab a nice comfy blanket, grab, get yourself a nice comfy spot, get a snack, just kick back, relax, and enjoy episode 42 of What Do You Say with DDJ, and my guest this week, Alan Funk. Hello there, wrestling fans. It's John Bolt, owner of Chicagoland Championship Wrestling, and you're listening to What Do You Say with DDJ. All right, uh, we are back with another episode of What Do You Say with DDJ, and joining me this week is a uh, former WCW, former WWE, former OVW, former NWA, total nonstop action star. He's literally been everywhere that you can all go. All Japan, in. baby. Oh, yeah, excuse me. You can't forget all Japan. Um, Lucha Libre uh, USA. <laughs> <laughs> he's been there. You know what? I may as well just let him tell me, uh, you guys where he goes here. But uh, joining me this week is uh, the man who you might have remembered as Kiwi. If you watched the late 90s, early 2000s WCW, if you were an early fan of uh, NWA Total Nonstop Action, you remember him as one half of the Rainbow Express, Bruce. Uh, but uh, joining me this week is Alan Funk. Alan, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? Good, boy. Thanks for having me, man. My pleasure. Thanks for coming on and uh, doing this with me. So I'm going to get right into it. Um, tell me uh, about how you discovered professional wrestling. Uh, I mean, at a young age, you know, just like probably everybody else, uh, just, you know, was a huge mark for the business growing up, not knowing what a mark was. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just uh, basically the whole reason I got into wrestling, man, Hulk Hogan was like my childhood, you know, hero, you know, I had right. my whole room was covered. You couldn't see a piece of the wall. There was Hulk Hogan posters everywhere. Uh, you know, then uh, my mom and dad grew up in kind of a middle class family, not too much money. Uh, mm -hmm. But my mom and dad would take me to the Richfield Coliseum, which is up in Cleveland. Yep. That's uh, no longer the Richfield Coliseum anymore, but uh, it was a great venue for wrestling, man. That's when I first, you know, saw, you know, Hulk Hogan and, you know, all the guys that I, you know, watch on TV and stuff. And uh, I, I had a fire burning in me and I always wanted to do it ever since, you know, I was probably, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old. Uh, and then when I got old enough to do it, I, I still really didn't know how I was going to get into it. Uh, so uh, me and my ex-wife, uh, fiance at the time, we used to watch Nitro and, you know, watch the Monday Night Wars like everybody else used to. And I uh, saw a power plant commercial, you know, where the, where the big boys train. And, you know, you come down here, you could possibly, like me and Chuck Palumbo talked about on my podcast a couple weeks ago, uh, you know, you, you possibly, you know, once you make it through the three-day trial – you could, you could possibly get a six figure contract, you know? And when I saw that, I was like, I, I didn't have any clue other than that, how to try to get into pro wrestling. So that's, that's the route I took. Wow. 
Wow, it's really interesting. We're definitely going to get talking about what it was like training in the power plant here in a little bit. But uh, you mentioned, obviously, Hulk Hogan was your childhood hero. You had Hulk Hogan stuff all over your uh, bed, your room and stuff. Was there anybody else uh, that you were a big fan of when you first got into wrestling? Uh, well, yeah, I, I like Macho Man. I actually, you know, even though Hogan and Orndorff feuded, th there were guys that I liked. I, I like certain things about them. I like their athletic, you know, ability, their, you know, how their body looked in this and that, which was Paul Wondorf always, you know, was like, man, that dude is built. I'd like to be built like him someday in the wrestling business, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I like certain things about everybody, you know, something about Ricky Steamboat, them arm drags he used to do. And, They're beautiful. you know, Chris Benoit, just his aggressiveness and stuff, which mm -hmm. is kind of how I was when, when they, when I could be angry Allen, which I, which I wanted to be all the time. I, 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 probably consider myself to be a lot like maybe a mixture of uh chris benoit and eddie Guerrero and uh you know somebody like that uh and then uh but, but when i was on tv i really didn't have an opportunity to really do what i wanted which which kind of sucked they kind of you know they give you a little bit of string and then they pull you back right when you was getting ready to try to you know make something your own you know so it was kind of frustrating when i when i came up through the wrestling business Right. So, um, so how old were you when you, you decided, you know, uh, you mentioned about, you know, being with your fiance, seeing the commercials for the power plant, uh, you know, while watching nitro, uh, about how old were you at that time when you uh, uh, decided that you were going to give it a shot? Yeah. I, I believe I was about 25, okay. uh, you know, and, uh, I figured, you know, I'm 25 years old, man. It's either now or never. I'm not getting any younger, you know, <laughs> but I, I had met, there was a, the old WWE, F back in the day when I was a kid, you know, they used to have the enhancement town, the jobbers, everybody likes mm -hmm. them. You, you know, you had like your Barry Horowitz, which is a great guy, man. I would never call him a jobber. Uh, cause he's right. a great, he's a great dude, a good worker, but you know, unfortunately that's how people see him. You know, uh, then I, there was a guy named kid Collins. I don't know. He was on the shows quite a bit, you know, there was pork chop cash, you know, the Malky brothers in WCW mm -hmm. or NWA. So I met this guy in Ohio, kid Collins. He had a wrestling school in, uh, but it was a few hours away from where I grew up. And, uh, you know, I was like a buddy of mine, Greg Anderson, that I started wrestling independence with. He, he went ahead and, you know, paid the two, three thousand dollars or whatever it was to go over there. And I just didn't feel like driving, you know, every weekend, three, four hours to go train. Uh, not that it, I didn't like the business or something. I just, I, you know, when you get, when I get something in my gut, I just, I, I pretty much listen to my gut and my gut was telling me not to train with those guys, uh, which I don't mm. think it would have been good for me you know, looking back on it. So I'm glad I followed my gut at the time, but, uh, you know, I'm glad, I, I'm glad I went to WCW. I wish I would have done things a little differently when I went there. Cause I had independent experience, which had I known would have probably helped me out by telling them that, but I never told them that cause I didn't want to get treated different than anybody else. Right. Gotcha. So, um, so you, so what, okay. So you mentioned having that first three day tryout at the, the power plant, you know, and that's kind of like, you know, you pass through that, you get the six figure contract. What was that three day tryout like for you? Oh man, let me tell you something, man. It, it was the hardest by far anything I've ever done in my life. Mm. Uh, the reason that is, is uh, they, w what these guys do, man, you had Sarge down there at the time when I went pistol yep. Pez Watley, which I don't know if a lot of people remember pistol Pez, but I've he was heard a great that name. Uh, you know, you, you had uh, Ron Reese was down there, which was in uh, the flock. He was yep. Reese, big Reese. Uh, but yeah, and actually Prince Ikea, which is a great dude, man. I love Mike to death. Uh, he was in there. He actually beat the shit out of me one day. Uh, but that that's just what they did down there. You know, there was no hard feelings with guys because, uh, you know, they wanted to make you quit. You went in there and it was the hardest three days of your life. Honest to God, man, after that tryout, which me and Chuck were talking about on my podcast a couple weeks ago. People will, you know, they, no matter what you tell them, they're they're probably not going to believe the full, you, you know, you know, people make up stories while they're telling stories. But uh, if you ever watched the A&E biography, uh, you know, inside pro wrestling or whatever that special was, right. the, the brutality of that, whatever they showed on that A&E special or, you know, they had behind closed doors with Joan London did a special down there one day whatever they showed you didn't do it justice. Even no matter how brutal you thought it was from them shows, it was 10 times as bad in real life. When you actually went through it, there was literally guys shit their pants trying to crawl <laughs> to the door wow. and people grabbing them by their ankles and pulling them back in the door. Wouldn't let them leave like grown men crying, trying to get out of there. That's how bad it was. Uh, in, in an average tryout, you had 30 guys, you know, for a three day tryout, 
I was the only one that made it through my tryout. I was the only one that made it on TV from my tryout. So, you know, it's something I'm proud of. A out of 30 guys, you know, I was the only one that made it through the three day tryout. So, you know, that it, uh, no matter how much I broke my nose, you know, they, I, I thought I broke my damn ribs, uh, had bruises and, you know, dents and dings all over me, man. Uh, uh, you know, they, they just, they tried the harder they tried to beat me, the, the, the more I wanted it. And, uh, you know, it showed they, they all recognized it after the fact, but, uh, during, during the trials, dude, it's, uh, it, it, it was no joke. Right. So you, um, so were there any, was there anybody else of like, when you got down there, was there like anybody that you saw that you kind of in secret, maybe like kind of either marked out or fanboy that you saw down there, like someone that maybe you had seen on TV that you were like, you know, like, Oh my God, I saw this person on TV and here he is right in front of me. Was there anybody down there during your tryout? Yeah, there, there was a lot of guys like that down there, but you know, at, at this point in my life, I, I wasn't really too starstruck. I, mm. I, I was focused on getting through this three days and, you know, even though the guys that were on TV were in there, I, I really didn't let that, you know, affect how I was thinking. I was just trying to keep my mind, you know, my mind on what I needed to do. Uh, like I said, I, I mean, I like Prince IK. I would watch him on TV and I always thought he was a great wrestler. Mm. And I met him during the tryout. Well, I really didn't meet him. He, uh, you know, he introduced me to an ass whooping, uh, <laughs> but because uh, Mike, Mike was a badass man. That dude was a, he was a shooter. Uh, yeah. and he was mean, but he was a nice guy in the world. But, uh, I remember he got in the ring, man. He beat the, he stretched me. He beat the crap out of me. But you know, by that point, you know, you got 15 guys in there. You're doing 1500 squats a day. You're push up. You're doing leg lifts. You're doing, you're running. You're, you're hitting the ropes. You're doing back bumps. You, you're doing front flip bumps, uh, in and out of the ring. You're going outside running. And when I did my tryout in July in Atlanta, Georgia, I don't know if you ever been in Atlanta, Georgia, man, but in the summertime, it gets pretty damn hot and it's humid. Mm -hmm. We're doing, you know, all we have is shorts on. They made us take our T-shirts off. We're outside doing push-ups and sit-ups and running back and forth out in the blacktop. And it's, I mean, it, it felt like it was 200 degrees outside. I'm sure, I mean, you know, that, that's that's how it felt. No water. They wouldn't let you get no water breaks. And I remember the one time when they said, first guy in the door from outside gets a water. I remember I was the first one that got inside the door. I, I uh, started filling up my water uh, cup in a five-gallon you know, one of them five gallon coolers. As soon yep. as I filled it up and went to put it to my mouth, take a drink, slap right out of my face, you know, couldn't even get a drink. Didn't get, even get my lips wet. And that's, that's just how it was. And they were, they were trying to break it, you know? Right. So what was it that kind of like kept what that, like, you know, obviously you yourself saying that, you know, just a little while ago that you were the only one out of the 30 in your, your tryout to make it. So what was it that kept you going? Well, it, to me, uh, I mean, I just try, I, I like to see how much pain I can take really. Uh, yeah. you know, I go to whenever I've had surgeries and stuff, like I got a, when I, I, I don't know if you heard about my accident in Helsinki, Finland, I got my face smashed in 2003. Sonny Siaki did a split leg moonsault off the road. Yeah, I, said, that's like I was reading something about that. Uh, like when kind of like looking up some stuff, uh, last over the last couple of days in preparation. Yeah. I'm a little twisted, man. I'm, I'm a little crazy. Some people would say, uh, I don't think I'm that crazy, but, uh, you know, I'll go to the dentist, tell him I don't want a Novocaine if you do something in my mouth. You know, I, I'll, uh, when I got the, I had plates in my eyelids, uh, mm. 24 karat plates cause my eyelids wouldn't close. So they had these plates in my eyelids. So my eyelids would shut at night when I laid down. So, you know, I went to the doctor, I had her cut my eyelids open without any Novocaine, you know, without any, yeah. anything just to see if I could take the pain. So, you know, that's it, the pain didn't bother me because I always see how much pain I could take anyway. You know, I let guys mm. break boards over my back or something like that. Just to, guys are like, man, you're crazy. And I'm like, hey, you know, whatever. If that's what you think. Wow. <laughs> so it just, it, it, you know, I just grew up that way. Hell, I got it from my mom and dad. We're both tough. My dad got his thumb cut off one day, went to the hospital, got stitched up and went right back to work. So I, I was, I just grew up around it and, you know, both my parents suffered through cancer and never complained one day. Mm -hmm. So I got their, you know, their mental toughness and physical toughness from my parents. Yeah. I, my, um, I'd mentioned you was talking to you about my dad a little bit before we started recording and unfortunately cancer claimed his life a couple of years ago, but yeah, he never once complained about it either. So. Yeah. That's hard to come by these days. Those are a dying breed as I like yeah. to call them. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. So what was the next step after those, that three day trial? Where did you go from there? Okay. So after the three day trial, uh, you know, I go into Jody Hamilton's office, which he was running a power plant with uh, Sarge, which was Buddy Lee Parker. Right. Yep. Uh, 
so they, they, after the tryout, the three days, you know, they called me in the office and said, Hey, uh, you know, you want to come back and, you know, we'll, uh, we'll let you train down here. They, they say it's up to six months and then you could possibly get a contract, but it's nothing guaranteed. They just said, you know, you could, you could come down here. Excuse me. And, you know, of course I'm, I'm from a house, so I'm living in Ohio. So, you know, I explained to them, well, I'm going to come down here in October. Uh, I'm going to give it, you know, give my work that I'm working at, you know, notice, tell them I'm quitting. I got to find a place to live down here. You know, I got to, I'm engaged to my fiance. So I got to figure out what she wants to do. So we figured it all out and then moved down here after my tryout in July, we moved down here in October of 1998. So uh, to do this, you know, the, the, the possibly six months training less mm -hmm. more, you know, whatever. I really didn't know what was going to happen. I had no guarantees. I just knew that it's something that I wanted to do. Right. So, so now we're talking, you know, we're about October of 98 now and stuff and you're down in Atlanta. Um, what was uh what was the training what was the training sessions like that once you got down there and started your training well they, you know there was a trainer in there mike winter uh he he worked with some of the guys that really didn't know too much or never been in the ring like i said i was an independent worker before i knew a little bit but i i, I acted dumb and i didn't i didn't want them to know i was i was trained in ohio uh a little bit and i did some independent shows because i didn't want them to treat me any different which looking back on i wish i would have told them because they, they once I got into the power plant stuff and guys would come down there for Terry Taylor, that had been independent workers, they would kind of give them like a lax days school tryout. That wasn't quite, quite like the three day tryout, which, <laughs> which that's, I'm not saying I wanted to get out of that three day trial because right. I'm glad I went through it. Right. Uh, you know, it just showed you that I really wanted to be in the wrestling business because they, they try to make you quit and they couldn't make me quit. But uh, you know, they, they, they would roll around, you know, th he would do some simple stuff with guys. Sarge would be in another ring with the more advanced guys you know, teaching them psychology and, and some moves and, you know, certain things like that. Uh, you'd get to get in the ring with uh, – when I was training down there, let's see, Mike at, Mike Sanders, above average Mike Sanders from the Natural Board Thrillers. Uh, Chuck Palumbo was in there. Mark Jindrak. Uh, Hard Body Harrison. Uh, he was one of the kind of enhancement work talent that was on the WCW Saturday Night Show. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you remember Chip Mitten. He was a world class Chip Mitten. He was an actual Olympic bobsledder. Uh, and he sounds familiar. And he came into the wrestling business. He helped me out a lot down there. Uh, you had guys like Chase Tatum, which had passed away, but he was uh, he was with like uh, shoot, what was it? Easy or not easy? Was he? No, it was uh, uh, Master P and the No Limit Soldiers. He was in there. Yeah. Group. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He was a big guy. Uh, and then they had uh, there was a couple Johnny Green. He was actually working with Hogan in that midget micro wrestling or whatever yes, it was. Yes, yes, yes. And Johnny Green actually passed away a couple years ago. Uh, oh wow! And uh, just guys like that down there. You know, we had we had Elix Skipper. He was one of my you know me Elix Skipper, Chuck Palumbo, Mark Dindrag, Mike Sanders, uh, Rick Cornell, Reno. Uh, he was in a Natural Born Thrillers. John yep. Huger, which was Johnny the Bull. Yep. Uh, guys like that. All, all the guys in the Natural Born Thrillers was in there. That's why we kind of had like a storyline on TV. And we kind of mm -hmm. all, we, we did a lot of independent shows together. So we always traveled together. And then we started doing like Nashville loops on the weekends for, uh, you know, some independent stuff up in Nashville. The WCW sent us up to do, uh, to get better and get, you know, so we can get on TV and uh, mm -hmm. start doing our thing. But we had contracts by then. So I started there October 98, like I said, by, I think, March, uh, me and Kid Romeo, Sam Roman, yep. uh, got a got a match on a WCW Saturday night. We were one of the first two that get a match on WCW Saturday night just because we were hard workers and you know we had great bodies and uh, so we finally got a break. And me and him did uh, two the Wednesday night we did in Roanoke, Virginia. They used to film two Saturday nights in a row, so there'd be. 50 70 500 matches i can't remember but some guys would wrestle twice that way you'd be on the show for you know the two weeks right so me me and sam both wrestled two matches together uh he he won the first match i went over in the second match so that way we, we kind of started a little rivalry and we were on the saturday night show every week so uh so how long did you uh how, how long were you on saturday night before you ended up giving getting moved to you know, like Nitro and Thunder and all that, like down to the main, main show. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't too long after that, really. Uh, once, mm -hmm. once you know, Sam and I, Kid Romeo, would uh, we did them shows, and then we were pretty much booked on every uh, Saturday night after that. They did it every other Wednesday uh, on the loop they were doing or whatever. So we, and we were doing security. We were doing uh, Bischoff and Russo security, R&B security. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that. 
So me, Mike, yep. Jindrak, uh, you know, Kid Romy, all these guys were doing uh, the security for uh, for that. We'd wear, wear the R&B security shirts and walk them to the ring and stuff like that. So we kind of got on Nitro pretty fast, maybe not as a wrestling, you know, as a wrestler, but we were, you know, we, I, we were at least on TV, you know what I mean? We were doing stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, I got to walk Sting to the ring one time, uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and then finally – uh, me and Mike Sanders were actually walking through an airport, and I think we we're in West Virginia. Terry Taylor and uh, Vince Rooster was sitting there, and I had my hair spiked up, and they didn't realize that I actually wore my hair like that. So we're walking through the airport, and they're looking at me like, "What in the hell is going on here?" <laughs> and uh, so they start talking to me like, "You actually wear your hair like that?" And you know, I'm like, "Yeah, you know what?" You, that's when me and Mike Sanders. I don't know if you remember this. It was kind of a short-lived deal where uh, him and I was doing a Saturday night shows, uh, the Double A team. Yes, uh, I'd come out and it was funny because Mike Sanders never wanted to talk on a mic. He was afraid to talk on a mic and then he became Mike Sanders and that's more thrillers. Mm -hmm. But uh, so we'd be I'd come out and grab the mic and, you know, say, you know, we're the double A team above average. Mike Sanders, angry Alan Funk. It, it takes two of us to do it for you guys do. And we don't even need a horse. That, that was our gimmick. Wow. So uh, the first time we did that in Knoxville, Tennessee, I told Mike, I said, yeah, let's let we're going to do it. And we didn't ask anybody permission for the promo. We just kind of said, fuck it, we're going to do it. So, uh, and then we were kind of afraid what Arn Anderson was going to say about that horse mm -hmm. and kind of poke, you know? So uh, after we did it the first time, you know, I'm like, yeah, this is average Mike Sanders. This is Alan, you know, angry Alan. And we're the double A team. And we're like, you know, we're better athletes than you guys. Cause it only takes two of us that what took four of you guys to do. And we don't even need a horse. And the crowd kind of booed it. You know, they're like, ah, what the hell is this guy? So then, you know, we, we beat a couple guys. We put over Jindra and O'Hare one night. Uh, mm -hmm. and it was kind of fun, you know, but they, it was short lived. That's when they had me do, they started having me do the Quee Wee gimmick. They started having Mike Sanders, you know, lead the natural born thrillers. And then we kind of separated from there. So, but it would have been, I, I would have loved to keep going at, you know, stuff with Mike Sanders. So what did, did, did you ever have any encounters with Arn Anderson during this time? And if so, what, what were those like, like, what did he have to say to you uh, about what Mike were doing? Yeah, yeah, no, all of it was positive. Actually, I forgot to finish the story. I, I get so, you know, sidetracked or whatever. You know, <laughs> okay. if I, I, I just, you know, babble on because uh, I'm trying to remember everything, you know. Right. Uh, so uh, after the match, you know, we walked back through the curtain. Here's Stan's Arn Anderson. I'm like, oh, shit. Like, he's going <laughs> to, he's pissed, you know. But he walks up to me and he looks, he shakes my hand, gives me a hug. And he goes, dude, that was awesome. I said, damn, I'm glad you ain't mad. I said, I thought you were going to be fucking pissed. He's like, no, no, dude, that was pretty cool, man. He goes, I liked it. You know, he popped on it. So me and Mike, I looked at Mike, I was like, whew, thank God he ain't pissed about that shit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we then we kept saying it, and uh, they actually liked it. So, you know, it was kind of one of them times where, you know, me actually taking something in my own hands actually worked. But, right. uh, you know, it, I had very few opportunities to do that. Right. So now you've mentioned you talked about, you know, the how uh, – T uh, Terry Taylor and Vince Russo saw your hair spiked in the air, and that's kind of where they got the idea for the Kiwi character. Uh, what was what was that meeting like when they 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 called you in and they presented you with the uh, the Kiwi gimmick? And then what were your thoughts on this after that meeting about you? Your thoughts on the Kiwi character at the time? Yeah. So uh, after well, I told you in the airport they saw my hair like that, and they they said, "Hey, we we might have something for you. We got an idea." So they said, whenever we get to the next show we're at, come and see us. We, we need to talk to you about something. So, uh, you know, I passing by, I was in catering, wherever, walking down the hall, and I seen him. I said, hey, Vince, uh, you know, you, you said you might have something for me. You want to talk to me about it a little bit? He's like, he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and he's like, he's like, give me a deal. He wanted me to do a character called Kiwi, mm -hmm. which is not Kiwi, which either name is kind of stupid, I think. But, you know, <laughs> it was something to get me on TV. And, you know, I, I really didn't really have a say-so in it. Right. And, and uh, so, you know, I, I went with it. The reason they, they had me as a Kiwi, they had, uh, I don't know if you remember Chris Catan. He used to do a character on Saturday Night Live called Mango. Yes, yes. I wasn't a big SNL fan, but I, I'm very familiar with the character. So, so And I, I watched the character a couple of times only because they told me to watch it. And I bought a tape of Saturday Night Live with his gimmick on it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I bought that tape. And the Mango was kind of an eccentric you know, character. And he was, you know, and then yep. I guess David Spade, which I, I never saw this episode. He was like his cousin called Kiwi or something. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's why they, they wanted me to kind of mix the two characters together and do something with that. So they said, we're going to make you the wardrobe guy. You're going to be a little flamboyant. You're going to be a little centric. But they told me as well, 
if we get any gay chance or anybody says fag or da da da, you're off TV. And I'm like, well, shit, you guys are pretty much setting me up for failure, aren't you? If you, I'm going to be kind of a, you know, kind of not a gay character, but kind of act like a little bit and stuff. And I'm right. I'm thinking to myself, man, this is not a good idea. But uh, then I, you know, then I said, I worked so hard to get where I'm at. You know, I can't tell him no, because they'll probably say, you know, who's this guy think he is? And uh, I was afraid to kind of say anything because, you know, I, I didn't know if it was going to get me, you know, ridiculed or if they were going to actually work with me. But, you know, either way, you know, I was kind of not naive, but I was kind of kind of said, well, let's see where it goes. I don't want to get you know, I don't want to speak up and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not Hulk Hogan. I'm not Sting. You know, I'm not the Steiners. I, I don't really have a say so. So right. I kind of just kind of went and, you know, went with, you know, what they were doing. And whenever, every time I brought something up, like, hey, can I do it this way? They're like, well, you know, we, we want you to do it like this. And, you know, I, I you know, my hands were tied. You know, I, I didn't have right. any other option. So, uh, so you got the gimmick. Um, how, how, uh, how, what, what was it like? Because I know part of the Kiwi character was also Paisley, aka Charmel Sullivan, who's you know married to Booker T now. Um, how did she get like uh brought into this? Like, who came up with uh, the well, with her uh, being paired with you? Well, initially, uh, if any wrestling fans out there remember the first couple uh valets I had, the very first one was uh, BB from WWE, she was Barbara Bush, remember yes, the yeah. Dudleys put her through the yeah. table. Yep. Kathy, she's her name's Kathy Dingman. Her and I are still good friends. Uh, so they brought her in, uh, and I didn't meet her all day. Uh, she was engaged to Bob Holly at the time, and Bob mm -hmm. and Bob pretty much had her scared to death. Like, I guess I don't know if he, he told her you got to stay in the locker room, you're not talking to nobody because he was real jealous. She he didn't want her to mingle with anybody because you know, I, I, I don't really know Bob Holly, but. You know, I, I've crossed paths with him a couple of times, never really talked to him. He, he was kind of an asshole, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and, you know, to treat a woman like that, that just goes to show you what kind of guy he is. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, she was afraid to come out of the locker room. Well, Dale Torberg, which was a demon, he was good friends with uh, Christy because they lived in uh, Daytona Beach, Florida. Right. So, so that, you know, they were friends. He's like, oh, dude, you got to meet Kathy. She's over here, whatever. And then I still never met her. And then when I went, then I saw her, one time and I walked over, Dale's like, Hey, this is Alan, this is Alan. Is he going to be working with, you know? And then I kind of shook her hand and we really didn't talk. It was kind of weird. She just disappeared. So then when it was ready to finally film something, here she comes and I'm trying to talk with her and we're trying to, you know, it was kind of, it was just a weird situation, man. And, uh, it, we really didn't gel and it, it, we didn't really have a direction and they kind of just threw us in this crap. Well then, uh, I guess Bob didn't want her to work there anymore. So she only lasted a week or two. Uh, then, then Mark Madden, which was one of the announcers, yep, he brings us. He's from Pittsburgh. He brings a stripper from one of the local strip clubs in Pittsburgh. Oh, so they bring her out. She's got huge boobs, kind of skinny, not really that attractive. So uh, they bring her one night. Say hey, she's going to be uh, Papaya or whatever. That's what that's what uh, Kathy's name was. So they just continue to call her Papaya, and uh -huh. uh, so. Uh, which was kind of stupid. Nobody knew what was going on because they never explained nothing. And, you know, it, it was just the way WCW was. They just threw shit out in TV and expected you to understand what was going on. Right. So I come out with this girl and I was married at the time then. Uh, so I come out all the way to the top of the ramp, the old WCW thing. You know, we, we come all the way down the ramp. I'm holding her arms like making out with her tongue and all. So I'm walking all the way to the ring, making out with a stripper. My wife had a freaking fit, dude, because <laughs> she didn't know anything about it. And I really didn't. And I'm not going against what they're telling me to do, because, you know, like I said, I'm new. I'm not going to, you know, right. I don't want to cause any friction because I'm trying to keep my job, man. So that happened. She was only there for a week or two as well. Then then they put Paisley with me. I started a program. They had Paisley start coming down to wardrobe. And uh, I would make I was acting like I was making gear and stuff for the, you know, for the people, you know, for all the wrestlers. So I'm ironing, sewing or whatever. She comes down. Uh, they wanted me to have like this thing where everybody that come across the Kiwi kind of got mesmerized because I was so good looking or I just had something about me that everybody was attracted to, you know. So right. then Paisley kind of fell under my spell, you know, because, I, you know, my magical eyes and I'm such a handsome dude. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, she fell in love with me. So then me and Prince started doing a program, which was unbelievable. And I, I, I love doing a program with Prince. So, you know, we shoot all the stuff, me and Prince, and we're doing all the stuff. I beat him on Nitro one night, 
which was phenomenal. I, you know, which, you know, thank God Prince wasn't an ego that uh, didn't want me to go over to try to get somebody else over. He, you know, he did that for me. So uh, then I, that, that's when I started really, you know, doing, doing some stuff on, on Nitro and Thunder. Right. Well, that's really cool. I, I, those are some great stories. So uh, one of the, the things that I wanted to talk to you about was uh, you uh, had a uh, match on what turned out to be WCW's last pay-per-view. I believe that was greed. Yeah. Jason, um, Jett. Jason Jett, AKA easy money, I believe from ECW. Yeah. Um, when, when at that point in time, did you know that WCW was about to go out of business or be done or what, what, what was your, what was your understanding of uh, what was going on in WCW at that, when you uh, got to that show that night? Yeah. So uh, Ross Foreman, I wasn't even booked on the WCW agreed. I went with a guy from the office, Ross Foreman. We, uh, mm-hmm. we'd always go, we, I met a few uh, baseball players, uh, Sean Casey for the red, Steve Klein for the, for the Cardinals. So that week they were having spring training down in Florida. So, you know, I told my wife, I said, Hey man, I'm going to go down and, you know, I'm going to go to the show and hopefully something's going to happen. But uh, in the meantime, we went to a couple of the spring training games, you know, saw a couple of our buddies playing, you know, pro baseball, had some, you know, fun with them guys. Right. Went As we were driving back from the baseball games, we were just, we weren't going to the arena. This was like a Saturday night or whatever. Kevin Nash calls us and says, uh, Hey, uh, Vince just bought the company and we kind of didn't kind of register. And we're like, what do you mean? Like, he's like, Vince McMahon just bought WCW. It's a done deal. So I'm like, well, shit, what the hell? Like, and then I was like, what do you think is going to happen? Like, I kind of got a little nervous, man. I'm thinking shit, you know, Vince McMahon just bought WCW. Do I have a job or, uh, you mm-hmm. know, what are they going to do with all the guys that just was thrown on TV and really kind of don't have any direction. So I, I was, I was kind of excited, kind of nervous. I didn't know what was going to happen. So, uh, you know, Kevin really didn't know, but he was being nice. And he said, you know, as far as I know, they're going to pick your contracts up and then, you know, we'll see what happens. So, uh, you know, until it happened, I really, I was thinking, ah, you know, it could be true. Couldn't, you know, I, but I'm like, you know, Kevin called us and told us. And I'm like, you know, I had mixed emotions. I really didn't think one way or another about it until. So we go, we go to the pay-per-view. You know, I'm backstage or whatever, and you know, whoever saw me or whatever and said, Oh, you know, we didn't know you were gonna be out here or whatever, and they're like, Hey, we, we want you to have a match with uh Jason Jett because they were trying to get him on TV and stuff, and they wanted to, you know, do something with him. Right. So, you know, and I don't have a problem with putting over anybody. You know, we have a good match, they wanted Jason to go over. That's fine with me. You know, I I'll, I'll work with anybody and try to get somebody over, you know. I mean, I, I wasn't even over at the time, so I was kind of, you know, honored that they wanted me to have a match with this kid, you know, the curtain jerker, first match of the card, mm-hmm. which in my opinion, if you watch that paper, it was one of the better matches on that card. It was, not, it was really good. Not just because I was involved in it, but Jason Jett, man, he's an underrated hell of a worker, bro. That that dude is unbelievable. Yeah, he is. So as far as I'm concerned, we tore the roof off that place. And I went backstage and everybody was like, dude, that was a fucking great match. And, you know, everybody backstage i walked by they're like dude that was unbelievable you guys killed it man and everybody's like shit that's gonna be hard to follow you know which makes you feel good when you go backstage and you got goldberg and all the main card guys telling you you guys just tore the house down man it's gonna be hard to follow you know so uh you know we're watching the card and this and that and at this time there was nothing going on there as far as like everybody talking about wwe it was i mean it's, it, in my shoes nobody was really talking about it mm-hmm I mean, I could be wrong. Maybe some of the other guys are talking about it, but I, I, I was never in a conversation that whole day about the WWE buying us out. So then the next day we go to the, the, uh, uh, pa- or was it Panama city beach? And, uh, we're, we're doing uh, the nitro. I'm, I'm booked on nitro. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to nitro anyway, even if I wasn't booked, but I was actually booked on the show. Right. So I'm pretty sure, I think everybody pretty much got booked on the show because they wanted everybody to be there to announce, you know, what was going on. So as soon as we walk in there, man, you know, I see Shane McMahon, I see Pat Patterson. I'm like, holy shit, this is fucking for real, you know? So uh, we're just walking in there and it's kind of weird. It's real quiet. Nobody's really saying anything. It was it, it was a lot different than a normal time you walking into Nitro. Mm-hmm. So you got uh, Doug Dillinger and some of the security guys, you know, we used to have to do a fingerprint to sign in. So they knew we were there on time. That way we could get paid. Right. Uh, 
so, uh, you know, we're, we sign in, you know, and we're walking back to the locker room, taking our gear back there. And, you know, everybody's still kind of quiet. You're, you're, you're seeing guys, you know, and then you're seeing a lot of the WWE guys that you've never seen before in any of the shows. So you're kind of like, it's starting to sink in, man. They actually bought us. So, uh, you know, guys were talking about it, but nobody really knew what the hell was going on. So we're just like, you know, the only thing everybody was talking about was shit. Wonder, you know, wonder what's going to happen. So, uh, you know, Shane, Pat Patterson, uh, Briscoe, you know, some of the WWE, you know, talent relations, Johnny Ace uh, was there. They, they say, hey, we're going to have a meeting down here in the catering, uh, you know, such and such a time. So we all go to catering, you know, we're, uh, we're all standing there in the meeting, you know, they're talking, Shane's talking, you know, they're, they're ensuring us that everybody's job's fine you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, we're going to have a show tonight. We're going to, you know, everything's fine. Don't worry. You know, we're going to work everything out, you know, trying to, you know, pretty much work people. Cause that, that was the farthest thing from the truth. If you ask right. me. Yep. So, uh, you know, they're, they might've had, excuse me, good intentions, but, uh, this is the way I try to explain to everybody. Everybody's like, well, you know, when I talk to people now, they're like, well, why don't you go to WWE? Why don't you go here? Why don't you go to AEW? I'm like, if it was that easy, do you, right. do you think I'd be uh, driving a semi truck now if I could go to WWE <laughs> or go to AEW? Right. It, yeah. You know, people don't realize it's even if you've been in the business, if you're not Hulk Hogan, you're not Goldberg, Triple H, Shawn Michaels, you're not just going to go to, hey, I'm going to have a meeting with Vince McMahon and, you know, I'm going to get my job back. It, it don't right. work like that. Right. Uh, you know, especially guys in my position, you, you got to kiss some major ass to get back in there. Mm -hmm. uh, or you got to know somebody, or you got to be somebody's buddy or for anybody to stand up for, you know what I mean? Right, but, right, you right. know, they did pick up our contract and I went to a few of the shows. Uh, then, then Johnny Ace calls me one day after, after the nitro, I, I was booked on the nitro that last nitro never, never did a match or anything. Uh, it was kind of a weird night of matches. Uh, if you remember that card, yeah, it, yeah. it was just a weird vibe. It, what, it, I mean, I had fun at the show. Don't get me wrong, but it was just, it was just different. I, I really don't know how to explain it. If you were there, you would understand what I was talking about. Uh, so then after the show, you know, we leave, you know, nothing was said about nothing. So, I mean, at, at this point, like me and Mike Sanders, uh, Jen Drack and all these guys, you know, that was in the power pan, Elix Skipper, Rick Cornell, we're like, you know, we're just going to go home and wait till we get a phone call. We're still under a contract. We're every, every Monday we go to the mailbox, we're getting a paycheck, but we don't know what's going on. Right. So uh, me and Mike Sanders, actually, and like I told you before, you know, I'm from a blue collar family, you know, middle class, you know, I'm used to working. I'm, you know, I'm not better than anybody else. I can't go get a job, you know, but I'm still getting paid. Right. Mike Sanders' dad owns a tow truck company. So me and Mike Sanders are driving tow truck for his dad, making extra money while we're still getting paid by WWE. Uh, that's just how I was raised. You know, I'm not just going to go home and sit down, and, you know, sit on my ass and wait for somebody to call me. Right. So, uh, you know, me and Mike are making extra money driving tow truck for his dad. Well, one day Johnny Ace calls me while I'm driving a tow truck. He says, uh, Hey, Alan, I got good news and bad news for you. He goes, what do you want first? And I said, that, I mean, give me the good news, Johnny. What do you got? He's like, well, you know, WWE is picking up your contract. You know that, right? I said, yeah. They, you know, and he said, they're going to give you a raise. You're going to make a little more money. I said, all right, cool. And uh, which wasn't a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. When I say raise, it wasn't like, you know, a six figure raise, <laughs> uh, but it was a little bit, you know, better than nothing. Uh, right. So then he tells me the bad news is you got two weeks to move to Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'm thinking, man, this is going to go over like a fart in church for my wife. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah. I can so, imagine. you know, so I go home, my wife gets home from work. She was a nurse or she is a nurse. We're divorced now, but, uh, so I go home, tell her she's fucking pissed, man. She's like, you're, we got to move to Cincinnati. I said, well, I said, listen, I don't know what's going on. I said, let me just go up there. Well, you know, me and I'd already talked to some of the boys by this point, you know, I was going to meet Rick Cornell, Mike Sanders, uh, Jen Drack, all these guys are going up there to HWA, which is in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is less Thatcher school. Mm -hmm. So we go up there. We all, we all get, we're, we're living in an extended stay, uh, Basically, you know, there's four of us sharing an extended stay because all of us at this point aren't making money that we can afford to have a, you know, a house we're paying payments on and right. a wife and kids or whatever all these other guys got and then have a house in Cincinnati, Ohio. We're just not making that kind of money. So, uh, you know, we all split a hotel. 
there's four of us. There's me, Rick Cornell, Jamie Noble, and Lash LaRue staying in an extended stay in two, like, queen-size beds. Mm -hmm. And it's got a kitchenette, and, you know, we're all sharing the bathroom. It was a pain in the ass. But, you know, <laughs> if you know anything about wrestlers, they can pretty much adapt to anything. Yep. And they're, they're used to working in shit shows, you know, you know, carnivals or fairs with, you know, no locker rooms, you know, no nowhere to dress. You're just dressing in the middle of everything, you know. So, you know, if anybody can adapt to this, a wrestler can. So we stay down there. We're down in Cincinnati for about six months now. So we're thinking. So Jimmy Yang, actually, he's down there. He meets a girl that he ends up having a, the Jazzy Yang with his daughter, if you ever see any of his social media stuff. Okay. So he meets this girl, and she's a, like a manager of an apartment complex. So we get an apartment complex. Well, we get an apartment in an apartment complex. We're not even paying rent. She's giving us a free place to stay. Wow. So, you know, we're all we're all popping on this because we ain't got to pay rent. What the hell? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even remember paying electricity or nothing, to be honest with you. So we're we're staying. At, now we're in an apartment, a two bedroom or was it? A, no, it was only a one bedroom apartment. So basically me and Jamie Noble were in the bedroom, sharing a bedroom. Rick Cornell and last we were sleeping on like inflatable mattresses and like egg crates in the in the living room. But at least it's not a extended stay hotel, you know right. what I mean? So uh and then the other guys get ho or uh they're all in the same. So Charlie Haas and his brother there, uh Eddie Fatu and his brother, uh, you know, Jindrak, uh Easy Money's there. Uh yeah, I'm probably missing some guys. Elix Skipper, Mark Jindrak, uh Shannon Moore was there. Uh and I can't remember it was no, nah, I don't think Shane was there. But uh, yeah. So we're all we're all doing this for like six months. We go down on Sundays. We uh, film a, a a TV show for the OVW, which was in Louisville, Kentucky. So every Sunday we drive down to Louisville, Kentucky. We're wrestling with, uh, you know, like I told you before, John Cena, Randy Orton, mm -hmm. Batista. You got uh, Rico was down there. A couple other guys that were you know WWE developmental talent. Uh, and man, the difference in the way that we got treated compared to the way that those guys got treated was unbelievable. Uh, you know, they, they were catered to all the time. Uh, you know, basically we, we had to fend for ourselves. And then I remember during Christmas time, we're down there. There's a list on the wall of everybody getting flights home for Christmas. So they had all the OVW guys like, you know, Cena, Batista, Orton, all these guys, you know, what time their flights were and their itinerary and this and that. Nothing with the WCW guys. Wow. So I, I ask, uh, I ask Cornette or I ask somebody, you know, what's going on? You know, you guys aren't getting us flights to go anywhere. Or no, I think I asked Les Thatcher. He's like, no, dude. He goes, you guys are on your own. There, you got nothing. You got to drive home or however you want to get there. You got to, you got, you know, you fend for yourself. Basically, is what he said. Uh, and you know that that's the difference of the way uh, we got treated. So at this point, I could already see. He, the way things are going to probably end up turning out because, mm -hmm. because up in the, at less that your school at HWA, you got uh, Eddie Fatu, you know, you got Steve Bradley, you got Lance Cade, which uh, he's passed away. He was with uh, yep. Murdoch. Yep. They were a tag team. Uh, you know, you got Charlie Haas and his brother, uh, Russ Haas, which passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you got all these guys from the Memphis territory that already been on WWE contracts. Basically what they had the WCW guys do come in since we had tv experience help train these guys um, and i think their whole plan whole long i don't care what anybody says was for us to come in there help enhance their talent and then poof we'd be gone which is exactly what happened johnny ace came in there one day they're making cuts everybody from the memphis side were safe from the jobs all the wcw guys gone except for maybe two three guys that's Wow. That was two weeks before Christmas. Happy, happy, Merry Christmas. Right. Yeah. You know, here's, here's your job's gone. Merry Christmas. Right. So, but yeah, that, that was a brutal time in, in the wrestling business for a uh, mm -hmm. few of us from WCW. Now, at that time, were you, uh, were you looking possibly to still continue on, or were you at this point maybe so just disenfranchised with everything? You're kind of like, maybe it's time to walk away. Like, what was your mindset at that? No, point? no, I, I never thought about walking away. I actually remember when Johnny Ace told me I was released. Uh, he said, "Well, I can help you get down to Puerto Rico because he knew uh, Victor Kionis, or I think that was his name at the time." Uh, he said, "I can help you get Japan if you want." 
I said, fuck, absolutely, John. I said, listen, this is a bump in the road for me. I said, I'll be back. I, I believed in my mind that mm. given the opportunity, I believe I could have been a Chris Benoit. I could have been Eddie Guerrero. I just never had the opportunity. Uh, and I believe that my, you know, I still believe that to this day, Right. given the opportunity, I, I could be a, a main roster guy, no doubt in my mind. Uh, but you know, unfortunately that never happened because I was never given the opportunity. Uh, you know, they may say they give me opportunities, but they didn't give me opportunities like that. I, that I think I deserved, but, uh, going back to Johnny Ace, tell me that he never, actually, I called him two or three times, never answered my phone call, never helped me get to Japan, never helped me get to Puerto Rico. I actually got to all Japan pro wrestling through a buddy of mine, Jerry too, which was the wall in WCW. Yeah. He actually passed away as well, but, yeah. which it's, it's amazing. The guys that I know in this business that they actually passed away, man. Yeah. So is. Jerry calls me up and says, Hey, cause I was talking to him. He was starting going to all Japan. I said, dude, I want to go over there, man. Help me out. And uh, me and Jerry were really good buddies, man. So he, uh, you know, he pulled some strings, talked to, you know, Muda and Cass Hayashi because he was in WCW and I was good friends with Cass Hayashi. So uh, <laughs> they're like, yeah, yeah, but let's bring him in. So they uh, they set it up. The uh, guy out in all Japan had a dojo in Los Angeles. The guy called me up, set up my first tour over in Japan, uh, making pretty good money for never being, you know, over there in Japan. Uh, the Japanese pay, you got paid weekly and they paid you cash. They paid you American money cash. So, you know, you didn't have to pay taxes or nothing on it. But wow. uh, so I started doing a couple tours of Japan. You know, I'm wrestling with uh, Mike Awesome. Uh, he was over there. The, my first tour, him and Jerry Toot, uh, Elix Skipper. Uh, now, Jimmy Yang was over there with all Japan, but I don't think I was ever on a tour with him. Uh, okay. Then, But I'm wrestling guys, dude. I'm wrestling like Japanese legends. I'm wrestling the great Muda. I'm wrestling Kawada, which was the top guy in Japan at the time. Yep. I, or, or I'm not. I'm sorry. Not come up. Kawada was a uh, he was a name in Japan. Don't get me wrong. Right. Uh, Kojima, which was like the top baby face in any promotion over there at the time. I'm wrestling <laughs> match with all these guys, man. I'm feeling like I'm on top of the world because you know I'm a big wrestling mark. So I'm like, man, I'm honored to be wrestling guys like the Muda and stuff over here in all Japan. And it, it was crazy, man. So I'm, you know, I'm going to Japan. I'm I'm excited, man. I'm happy with where I'm at. I mean, I I, I could have finished my career in all Japan wrestling. I'd have been happy. Uh, but, uh, you know, I was doing what I was loved, and I was getting paid for it. I got to travel, you know. I, I was in every damn city in Japan you can imagine. It, I mean, it was great over there. And then uh, Jerry, too, passed away on one of the tours over there, which I I wasn't on that tour because I just got off a tour, and uh, he was one of the main guys over there at this point. He was kind of doing like a Stan Hansen gimmick where he'd run around with a bull, you know, the rope and the bullhorn and, right. or, the, or the cowbell, and, you know, he'd literally hit people with this stuff. So, you know, him and Mike Awesome, uh, I started wrestling like a three-man tag with him. And then I started becoming, you know, people starting to recognize me. And, you know, then I start going over there. But the one tour that I didn't go on, that's when Jerry overdosed snorting Oxycontins. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I got a call in the middle of, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. Cass Hayashi calls me. Hey, man, Jerry, you know, and Cass speaks English, but not very well. You know, mm -hmm. he's speaking broken English, telling me it's two o'clock in the morning, answer my phone. I'm like, who in the hell? So he's like, hey, uh, this is Cass Hayashi, you know, and he's like, hey, uh, Jerry Sutton, uh, he no, no, he no here. He, he, he died. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, uh, Jerry, Jerry son, Jerry son, no, he, he died today. I'm like, holy shit. And, you know, I'm crying because Jerry's a good friend of mine, man. I'm, and, you know, for him to call me, he didn't know his dad. He's like, you know, Jerry, dad, you call Jerry, dad, tell him Jerry died. I'm like, holy shit, man. Wow. Like, this, is a, this is a lot to take on, you know? So uh, I called Dale Torberg because Dale Torberg's good friends with him. And I called Rick Cornell because Jerry usually after a tour of Japan would go to Las Vegas and spend some time with Rick Cornell and his family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I call Rick, I call uh, Dale Torberg because, you know, we're all just kind of a tight knit group. So, uh, you know, Dale and his wife are crying. I'm crying. It was a mess. Rick's crying. And uh, so I got to call Jerry's dad, which I'm not looking forward to. So uh, Jerry was dating a girl in WCW's office. Her name was Kimber. She had something to do with, uh, at this point, WCW is no longer, obviously. She was doing something with some monster trucks and stuff like that. Uh, so I get her number and call her, and I ask her. Well, actually, I did call her, but I, I actually think Dale – called her and asked her to call Jerry's dad because she'd met Jerry's dad. I'd never met Jerry's dad. Now I, I just, 
I mean, I would have told him if I had to. I just wasn't covered with all because I never met right. that. And you know, you know, his son's one of my best friends. He's in New he's in New Jersey. I never met the guy. I feel, you know, I'm so I feel so bad as it is, and I didn't want to tell his dad that his son just died. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, they take care of that. Kimber calls him, uh, takes the burden off of me. You know, and uh, that that was one of my crazy all Japan stories. But uh, wow, so that, cool. that, that's how that went. And then after Jerry died, I, for some reason I don't get booked anymore in all Japan. So I'm like, God dang, you know. It's always something, man. I just can't stay booked on these, you know, in these promotions. So one other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, at your time in uh, the early days of the NWA TNA. Uh, how did that come about? And uh, obviously your time in there, you, re you were known as Bruce, the one half of the uh, Rainbow Express with uh, Lenny Lane, and you were managed by Joel Gertner. Tell me what the how you got in contact with NWA TNA and then also – like your feelings on uh, the Bruce gimmick. Well, yeah. So I'm sitting at home one day. I get a call from uh, Jerry Jarrett, which is Jeff Jarrett's dad. Right. Uh, you know, he's, he's telling me, Hey Alan, you know, uh, I, I want you to come in. We're, we're, uh, we're going to do this thing. NWA TNA. It's an, it's, you know, promotion. We want you to be part of it. Uh, explain to me how he wanted my character to be. And he told, he told me to watch, I think it was Will and Grace where that gay guy was on it. Yes. I believe that's a little skinny gay guy. Uh, he, he told me to watch Will and Grace. He goes, when you see this guy, I want you to kind of act. That's kind of your character. I want you to act like that. I'm like, God dang, can I not get away from this flamboyant shit? You know, mm -hmm. like I'm really not comfortable doing it, but again, he's not really giving me an option. He's saying, this is what I want you to do in our promotion and kind of take it or leave it. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So I'm thinking, well, shit, I'm going to get back on TV, you know, I'm going to take it. I'm not going to leave it because, you know, I work too hard to try to get to where I'm at and then just let it end. You know what I mean? So I get to TNA. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm friends with Lenny because, you know, I, I crossed paths with him in WCW and mm -hmm. we traveled together a little bit. You know, we'd, we'd get to rent a car and drive the hotel or the arena stuff here and there. So, you know, I knew of Lenny, but we weren't the best of friends. So, but Lenny and I became good friends and we still talk to this day. So uh, we're, uh, you know, we're excited because they're they're explaining to us over the phone, you know, and he's, they're telling Lane the same thing that we're going to be the tag team champs. They're going to they're going to engineer the whole tag team division around me and Lenny, which, you know, I'm thinking, shit, Lenny's a seasoned veteran. You know, I've been mm -hmm. around the business a little bit. Kind of we're going to fi finally we're going to get our dues are going to finally pay off and we're going to get to do what we want to do. So when we get there the first day, we're in Huntsville, Alabama. Everybody's at this show, man. I mean, I'm talking you know, you got Ken Shamrock, you got, I mean, every damn star that's not in the WWE is at this car. Right. They got, they got Toby Keith opening up. They got, you know, uh, NASCAR drivers, you know, they got Sterling Marlin. They got all, all these, you know, Saddlers, yeah. the, all these NASCAR drivers. They got people from all entertainment aspects at this show because they're promoting this thing. And so I'm thinking, man, they're spending some money. This is a real deal, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so we're in a big arena in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, you know, we go in a meeting, me and Lenny meet with uh, Bill Barron's, uh, Jeff and Jerry Jarrett, uh, Bill Prentice, or Burt Prentice, which is, uh, he was running like the Nashville territory and stuff. And he's been around uh, the old WWE territory down in Louisville, uh, the USWA, or I think it was called. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're in a meeting. So they're telling me and Lenny, hey, look, this is it. You're our tag team champ. You know, you're going to be our guys, man. So they're, they're telling us all this, 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 I mean, they're promising us the world, promising us the world. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, me and Lenny, we're talking about it. We're like, well, we're not, we don't believe nothing until it happens. Right. So, which is the case in wrestling. If you believe what anybody says, you know, you're going to get disappointed. So, uh, and you, you're going to get disappointed anyway, probably. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, me and Lenny's like, you know, so we go, they want us to take all these, uh, pictures they they got you know they got us doing all these photo shoots you know we're gonna be the champs lenny and bruce rainbow express you know and i don't think i don't at this point i hadn't even i don't even remember meeting joel Gert, gertner at this point okay so as, after we do all our pictures our promos and all this stuff so we go backstage and stuff and they're like joel gertner has been a, gonna be your manager he we want him to come up with some kind of you know how he's coming to the mic and do some kind of poem song yeah his little stick or whatever yeah stick. yeah it was awesome man joel's joel's yeah. great man 
so uh you know the the time that i got to work with joel i really enjoyed working with him man he was he was a top-notch first class you know so uh so the first night we wrestled i'm sorry my mouth's getting dry oh you're fine you're fine so first match already it's not going as planned they have which turned out to be america's most wanted chris mm -hmm. harris and james storm so they come to us and say okay this is what we need from you guys first some in lane's like okay they're like we need you to do the job for these two kids and me and lenny's kind of like all right we'll, we'll do the job for the kids they're gonna be they're gonna put the belts on us i mean how can we say no you know what i mean right so the gimmick was me and Lenny were already in the ring. Joel Gertner does a stick. They, they have, I think it was Bill Barron's or somebody run out to the car. These kids are, well, I call them kids because at the time we, you know, we were all kids. Right. But they wanted us to put over these kids, these young kids that they want to try to put over in, in, the, in the company. So they're out there, got their suitcases, just getting out of the car. And they're like, hey, we want you guys to wrestle this match. You got to get to the ring right away. So if you remember, if anybody remembers watching that, which was on pay per view, which probably a lot of people didn't watch it, mm -hmm. James Storm, which became the America's Most Wanted with Chris Harris, which was multi tag team champions in, yep. in, in NWA. Great team. So how many times? I say great team. I, I want oh, to say team. yeah, like I think ten times like or something. Five or six, like five or six times, I think, or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So uh, so they run the ring. You know, we have a pretty good match from what I remember. It wasn't too bad of a match. You know, we, we put them over. So then uh, the next week, you know, they got it. Well, the next couple of weeks, you know, they're having a tag team tournament to decide the champions. Right. So, you know, me and Lenny, obviously, at this point, we're like, well, fuck, we're going to win this. They already told us. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we get to the arena. We're going to we're going to wrestle a couple matches because how it works is if you win, you go to the next step, you know, like right. a bracket. Yep. They got the bracket. So me and Lenny wrestle. Marcus Bagwell, Marcus Bagwell, because he's I refuse to call him the other name mm -hmm. uh, for for different reasons. So Marcus Bagwell and Apollo, which is a wrestler from Puerto Rico, I believe, yeah. which is a great talent. Apollo was top notch. I, you know, I don't have anything bad to say about Apollo. Uh, we, ha we have a pretty good match with these guys. We go over these guys. So we're, we go to the next level. And honestly, by this point. I don't believe Lenny and either one of us know that we're not going to win the next match. So, you know, cause we're thinking we're the champions. They've already promised us the world. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then they put this team together. That's not even a team, which is to me, this is just like old WCW. WCW is running shit. You know, it's the same shit. They don't yeah. have a rhyme or reason why they're doing shit. They got me and Lenny, which is an established tag team already in their division. And their promotion, they already promised they're putting the belts on us. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying nothing bad about Jerry Jarrett or Jeff Jarrett or anybody. Right. But I'm just telling you the, the facts and the way this went down. So uh, they put together a team of two guys you might know, Jerry Lynn and AJ Styles. Oh, yeah. Very familiar with both of them. So they end up beating us for the belts. Mm -hmm. And me and Lenny are like, what in the hell? I mean, they were not even a team. They just threw these guys in there to – you know, and I think Jerry was even hurt. Jerry Lynn was hurt, I believe. He had some kind of leg, knee, or something. I thought he was hurt. Okay. So, and I think that was a shoot. He was actually hurt. So, you know, I think AJ was doing most of the work in the matches, or or vice versa. Or one of them was hurt that I remember. So these guys aren't even a tag team, and they just threw these guys together to beat the guys that they promised to be the champions that are an actual tag team. So me and Lenny knew right then and there. We're like. <sighs> our time's probably pretty short here, which I don't know if we pissed somebody off because we didn't do anything out of the way that we shouldn't have done. And mm. uh, I don't know if we would have had heat with anybody. And that's the problem with the resume is you can get a heat from, you know, putting your hat on the wrong way. Uh, and that's just the way the rest of business is. So I don't know if we got heat with somebody and nobody told us because nobody's going to tell you if you got heat with them, you're going to find out from somebody else. Right. And the rest of business, like I said, it's easy to get heat. Uh, you, you could walk by somebody the wrong way and not shake their hand at the exact time they want you to shake your hand. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've heard stories. So, uh, you know, me and Lenny are like, fuck, we didn't know what was going on. So, you know, we kept getting booked on the shows. Eventually I would wrestle. Lenny wouldn't. He'd just walk me to the ring. Eventually Lenny's off the show. 
just me wrestling now. Now they want me to be Miss TNA. I'm fighting with women. So I'm wrestling Kathy Dingman. She was the Miss TNA at the time. She had a right. sash and wore a crown. So I end up beating the crap out of her. I win the Miss TNA. I'm Miss TNA. I wear, I come out wearing a sash, a robe, and you know the crown, all the, the whole nine yards. So then eventually I just get taken off. I, I mean, I just get weeded out eventually. So uh, I'm not really sure what happened. I'm not sure why. Uh, they always seem like they were happy with what I'm doing. So I, I, I really don't know what happened with TNA, honestly, other than they just quit booking me for the show. Wow. So your time there has come to an end. You know, obviously, you know, with the death of uh, your friend uh, Jerry Toot, uh, a.k.a. The Wall, you know, that your time in all Japan seemed to be up. Uh, what did you do? What did you do after that? Uh, well, I, you know, I tried to stay booked on stuff. I actually went back to all Japan for one tour. Uh, I got, I got, I was doing some indie shots. I got, uh, we was in Helsinki, Finland. Me and Mike Sanders were actually wrestling Elix Skipper, Sonny Siaki. Sonny Siaki does a split leg moonsault, smashes my face to pieces. Mm. You know, I'm in a hospital for three weeks over there. Got my eyeball popped out of my head, broke my nose, my overall socket, my jaw, bleed it out of my ears, broke both my eardrums, had a skull fracture. So, I'm left for dead. They tell the doctor tells Mike Sanders he comes to the hospital with me. He he goes out of the room. Come, I remember him walking back in the room and he was real weird. I couldn't really see at this point. I mean, my eyeballs hanging out of my damn head. Uh, yeah. All I can see is blurry, like you're opening eyes up in a school uh, underneath the swimming pool, you know. Right, right. So, so uh, Mike comes in acting real weird, real quiet, just saying, "Hey, buddy," you know, you know, you know, not really saying too much. Later, I find out. After I get home three weeks later, Mike tells me, hey, man, do you remember when I walked back in the room that time and I was kind of weird? I said, yeah, man. He said, the doctor told me to go in there and say goodbye to you because you were dead. He said you would no way live through the night. Wow. So that's what the news that Mike Sanders got. So, uh, you know, I spent three weeks in the hospital there, come back home, trying to recover from that. It took me a good nine months. I couldn't drive because I really couldn't see. I, I lost my vision. Uh, I didn't have any hearing in my ears because both my eardrums were broke. Uh, bleeding blood pouring out of both my ears that night. Mm. Uh, still had dried blood in my ears. They, I'd go to the doctor. They'd pull more blood and blood out of my ears. I had a few surgeries on my right eye. Uh, you know, I explained to you earlier, I had uh, silver or uh, gold 24 karat plates yep. in my eyelids that they put inside my eyelids because I didn't have any control over anything. No face. I couldn't even drink out of a straw. I couldn't drink out of a cup. I had to hold my bottom lip just to drink out of a sippy cup. I had to go to the store and buy a sippy cup for kids just to drink water out of it. Wow. And uh, so for about nine months, I was like that. Uh, then I started training again, uh, going in the gym from total, you know, ground zero, bro. I lost so much weight. I didn't work mm -hmm. out for almost a year. Uh, you know, didn't eat where the crab because my jaw was broke. I was eating soup and pretty much nothing how I normally eat. I eat a high protein diet. And I eat a lot of chicken and steaks and stuff. Couldn't do none of that. Uh, finally start training again, feeling better. Uh, TNA said they didn't want to, well, I know what it was. I'm sorry. TNA but, said they didn't want to use me because they thought I was a liability because of my injuries. Okay. Which, which is understandable. Uh, I don't know why I forgot that. <laughs> I'm all over the place, man. I apologize. Oh, good, man. This is very, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. And I did so, my uh, as well. Yeah. So that, okay. It's coming back to me. They tell me they didn't want me to wrestle. I go, I actually go to one of the shows. I take a buddy of mine from Atlanta that actually moved to Nashville. He's like some kind of accountant or some money guy. Uh, so he, I said, Hey, I'll take you to the show. You want to go to the show? Just come pick me up. So I had a house in Atlanta. My wife just started working in Nashville coincidentally because she wanted to be a traveling nurse. Mm -hmm. So she goes up there, we get an apartment in Nashville. So I said, just pick me up in my apartment and uh, I'll take you to the show. Cause at this point I still couldn't drive. So he, he takes me to the show. You know, everybody was really cool. Uh, Shane Douglas was there, which he was over in Finland. And Shane gives me a hug and Kid Cash, you know, and uh, they're like, uh, hey, man, you know, we're unbelievable. We can, we, that is the worst accident we've ever seen in wrestling. They, you know, they were telling me about it and stuff. And uh, so then TNA pretty much, they kind of told me they didn't really want to use me because they were afraid that I wasn't right, you know, Ooh. from my injury, which I understand. And right. uh, so then I was never used again. Uh, but then at this point I started training, I'm, I'm getting my visions coming back. I start driving, I'm training a lot more. I'm gaining weight. I'm getting in shape again. Uh, then, uh, all Japan called me again and said, Hey, we'd like you to come over. Are you able to wrestle? 
at this point, yeah, it was like a year to the day I got hurt. Uh, I'm like, hell yeah, I'm not going to pass that up. Right. So I started training real hard again. I go down and get in the ring and really start training. I'm back in, you know, ring shape. Uh, still not a hundred percent, but I'm not telling nobody that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, cause I'm not, I'm not passing up a chance to wrestle in all Japan wrestling again, you know, with Moda and Kazahashi and right. Kawada and, you know, Kojima, I'm not, I'm not passing that up. So I get back over to Japan year to the day and, uh, start wrestling for all Japan again. Uh, but it, it was a short lived. I only did a couple more tours after that and never went back since, you know, Jerry died. So, uh, you know, that, that, that was pretty much my time in all Japan that I didn't know I was done. Wow. So, uh, so, uh, so what are you doing now? Uh, like what, what, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? Like what's, uh, what's yeah, from, you going? Yeah. So from there, uh, you know, I was still, I didn't want to be out of the wrestling business then just cause nobody's right. booking me. I'm not, I'm not done by any means. I'm not going right. to give up. So, and I'm in, I'm still in pretty good shape now. I'll be 50 in July and I'm, you know, I'm in a lot better shape than a lot of kids that are 25. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, uh, I take pride in taking care of myself. I eat right. You know, I go to the gym six days a week. You know, I don't do much cardio as far as ring shape. I'm probably not in good ring shape, but I'm in mm-hmm. good physical shape. Uh, there's a difference if you know anything about being a ring. Shape. I've, I've, I've heard a lot of stories about that. So yes, I'm very familiar with, you know, ring yeah. shape versus like, you know, your body and stuff like that. Yeah. Very yeah. Good. So, so I'm not, in, I'm not in great ring shape, but I, I could get back there. It wouldn't take me long if I got the right offer, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm at this point, I'm still, I'm doing some shows with WWA, Andrew McManus. He's a guy out of uh, Australia. He's running shows with uh, Steiner and Nathan Jones, which mm-hmm. was in WWE. Uh, you know, we got uh, Stevie Ray. The cat was on the cards. Uh, Nova from ECW. Uh, Crowbar from WCW. Uh, AJ Styles was on the tour. Uh, Jerry Lynn. Uh, Jeff Jarrett. You know, Scotty Steiner. You know, guys like that. So we're. Right. I, I did a couple of tours with WWE over in Australia. So you know, and it was something good. It was. It was good. Uh, the pay was decent. Uh, so I'm doing that. I'm doing independent shows. I'm still working a little bit for Bill Barron's up in the NWA wild side, which is, that's where AJ Styles started. Right. Uh, you know, doing stuff like that, independence, you know, no, nothing major, not doing TNA anymore, not doing all Japan, but just trying to stay in the business. Right. Uh, working, you know, weird jobs. I'm working for a landscape company, running a Bobcat, like a skid steer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Oh, you my know, son would love to see that. He loves that kind of stuff. Yeah, right. So, uh, you know, I'm familiar with heavy heavy equipment. I used to re- work in a landfill right out of high school. Okay. So I had a little bit of experience with heavy equipment. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing stuff like that. You know, I, I was actually an armed security guard at one point. Uh, went went through the, you know, all the training for being an armed security officer, carrying a firearm. Uh, then from there, I, I went and got a CDL license and i started driving semi truck cross country with a uh, another guy that used to be in the wrestling business uh uh brian volrath his real name he used to wrestle uh we used to wrestle good old days in atlanta with the wcw guys he did a gimmick down there and he used to wrestle on a lot of tours overseas like in africa and stuff with uh, some of the older guys uh but uh him and i i saw him one night he goes hey i got a cdl i'm driving i said really i got my cdl too and he's like well hey give me a call and you know i've known the guy now for 22 years at the time you know 15 17 years or something mm-hmm. so i start i hook up with him we start driving as a team going out to california from atlanta and then uh, i drive there for about six eight months get a little bit of experience i go he leaves uh so i get another job We're, and then we both go to the same company again we're hauling oversized concrete uh, it's a heavy haul oversized concrete give me experience doing that now I'm hauling uh, uh, excavators and stuff like that, heavy equipment for a uh, construction company. Wow. So uh, a couple more questions here before I let you go. Um, do you follow the current product at all today? Mm. You know, I, I do off and on. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not right now. I'm not real, a real big fan of any of the wrestling. Uh, I'll watch AEW because I like Chris Jericho and uh, mm-hmm. I kind of like what they got going on. They're trying to do something different. And, uh, you know, Tony Khan's really trying, you know, he's, he's trying to change the resume business, man. I, you know, I got to respect that. Uh, right. Because all, the only other option you got is being in WWE, really. You got mm-hmm. the NWA power that's down here in Atlanta, but they kind of got their, a certain four or five people on that, you know, and I don't think anybody else is getting a job there. Uh, I never really tried to get in any of those. Uh, me and Lenny and Lodi were wanting to try to maybe get an AEW, do a gimmick in there. 
because uh, Lodi uh, trains Arn Anderson's son in, in Charlotte. Okay. So, okay. Uh, you know, he's, he's helping him train to get in the wrestling business, and we thought that might be our end. But, uh, you know, not, you know, the wrestling business is weird. You know, it, for, you know, for a year, nothing might happen, then all of a sudden somebody might call you and say, hey, let's do it. You know what I mean? So, right. you know, I, I'm not putting all my money into that, but, uh, you know, it's it's not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, as mm-hmm. far as my career in WWE, I'm sure that's long gone. Right. So uh, so that's pretty much it in terms of questions I have. Uh, but uh, one thing I want to give you some time to talk about is, is your podcast. So uh, take as much time and uh, talk to my audience about your podcast. Yeah, yeah. So I appreciate that. I started a podcast uh, – I got, I'm three episodes in it's on, it's live Thursday nights at 7 PM Eastern time. Uh, and it's called get funked. And it's, uh, I started with uh Piers Austin, which started mm-hmm. the MWA podcast network. And it's on, you can follow us on, uh, you know, Instagram. I got a, my account is Alan funk. I guess you could just type Alan funk in, uh, a L L a N F U N K same with Facebook. Uh, it's funk Allen at Instagram. I think it's Alan Funk at Facebook. Uh, and then to follow my podcast, Get Funked, uh, you can go to Twitch or YouTube. We're going to stop, I guess, well, actually today, they stopped doing the live Facebook on uh, for our podcast. So uh, it's going to be on Twitch. It's You can look up M, which is M is in Mike, W is Whiskey, A is in Alpha, uh, World, MWA World on uh, Twitch or YouTube. And then subscribe to the channel, download the Twitch app, which is good because it'll notify you if you follow us what podcast is coming up. I don't know if you're familiar with Twitch or not. It's a little bit somewhat, yeah. Yeah, so you download the Twitch from the Google Store or the Apple Store. Yep. Uh, you can subscribe to the channel, the MWA World Podcast Network. Uh, it'll, like, Piers has got a show on there, uh, which is shooting the shit. Uh, you got uh, one of the ECW originals, the Kingpin, Angel Medina, Balt, one of the Baldies. Yes, yep. He's got a show on Friday nights at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern. You got uh, the Dead Presidents. They got a show on Sunday nights at 9. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're trying to get this thing rolling, man, the NWA Podcast Network. So everybody check it out. You can follow us on YouTube or Twitch at MWA World. All right. So last question, and this is actually not a wrestling related question because this is a question just ba- that I've had in my head since I saw what you have on your hat and what you have behind you. Yeah, baby. Um, and for those of you who are want- listening to this on, you know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever, um, Alan's wearing a, a hat and has a calendar behind him of uh, the Ohio State Buckeye. Yeah, it's not Oklahoma. It's the it's Ohio State. The Ohio State. State. So I have to ask, I am a diehard Chicago Bears fan. What are Bears fans getting with uh, Justin Fields? Well, I mean, if anybody watched him, I, I got to tell you, I wasn't a big fan of Justin Fields when he came to the Buckeyes. Mm-hmm. Just for the fact that he couldn't really read defenses, which he had a hard time still with. But he couldn't have went to a better team when he went to Ohio State because Ryan Day, the head coach there, uh, really worked with his kid. And I believe they probably designed the whole offense around him because uh, mm-hmm. he, he's he's – don't get me wrong. I, I don't want to say nothing negative about Justin Fields because I heard he's an incredible human being. Right. Uh, but he, as far as like his uh, ability to read defenses, like I was saying, uh, but his athletic ability is, you know, second to none. Uh, and, you know, the kid can make things happen. He's got an arm on him. So mm-hmm. what the Chicago Bears are going to get is a, an athletic individual that can throw the ball a mile long and, and can make things happen, which I think that's what the Chicago Bears need. Absolutely. But uh, with, with the right coaching and mentoring, the kid's going to be, in my eyes, I think he, he could be a really good uh, quarterback. So, uh, you know, we'll see if he can break that Ohio State jinx of quarterbacks going to the NFL. Well, we just – not only that jinx, but to just the jinx of the Bears actually having a good quarterback. Well, I, you know, they, they had decent quarterbacks. They just yeah. – the problem with the Bears, in my eyes, I don't tell – you know, correct me if I'm wrong. They don't have a great overall team. They have good individual players. Mm-hmm. They don't have they. They're missing the cohesiveness. At, at, you know, in all the positions. Right. And I, 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 I think agree. that's pretty accurate. That's not saying that negative about the Bears. No. Which I'm not a Bears. I'm a Cleveland Browns fan. I'm from Ohio, so. Right. You know, hopefully the Browns are going to do good this year. They did pretty good last year. They did but, very well uh, last year. But, you know, I, I really – I was surprised Justin Fields went to the Bears. I thought he would go before that, honestly. 
Me too. I was very pleasantly surprised when, you know, he fell, I think it was out of the top five. And then like, I, and then I know they were, up, I think the giants were up at number 11. The next thing you know, I look at my tracker and I see the bears are picking. I'm like, Oh my God, they're getting someone. And then when they announced they got him, I was so happy. So. Well, I tell you one thing I am happy with. I'm not, I'm not an sec fan. Cause I, I, I live in Georgia now and I'm a big 10 fan. Mm -hmm. So being down in Georgia for 22 years now, I've taken a lot of slack from everybody. I mean, I wear my Ohio State stuff wherever I go, and I'll I'll fight you to death yep. if you say something bad about my Buckeyes. But the SEC fans, and the reason I can't, I still am not a Georgia fan, I cannot stand Georgia for the simple fact that their fans are the most obnoxious, uneducated football fans, mostly. I know a couple guys in the gym that are pretty educated fans. Mm -hmm. But as as a whole, the Georgia fan base are nothing but a bunch of freaking rednecks that think they know everything about football. And don't get me wrong, I never played football. I played football, you know, in in like middle school, right, uh, and stuff like that. But I, I'm no by no means a football player. But I got the if I would have played football, I would have been pretty decent as far as my mental and physical abilities, and I, and I'm pretty athletic. But I chose wrestling instead. But having said that. Their fans, you know, and a lot of these guys never played football a day in their life. But they, they, their, their one line is, oh, oh, well, "Next year, wait till next year, right? Wait till next year. You're, you're gonna get it, <laughs> you know." And it's like, I can't wait till next year because you know it's been since 1980 since you won a title. These guys talk like they win a championship every year. That's how mm -hmm. obnoxious the Georgia fans are, and they, they don't have a clue what they're talking about, other than maybe a handful of guys that I've met in 22 years in Georgia might know what they're talking about. The rest of them just, wow, ah, you wait till next year. You know, and then I, Mark Ricks, you remember their coach, Mark Ricks? The, uh, not particularly. No, the guy was at Georgia for f at least 15 years, right? 15 mm -hmm. years. I, he might've won an sec title, sec title, okay. not a national title. Maybe he might've shared one. Maybe. I think you might have shared one with LSU in 2009 or eight or something. So the guy's there 15 years. Everybody's, he's such a nice guy. He's so nice. He does so much. I'm like, really? Has he won a football game? Because if I'm hiring a coach paid a million dollars, I want him to win a football game. I don't right? give a damn if the guy says hi to me or not. If he's winning football games, if he's a nice guy, that's a bonus, right? But if you're a, he's such a nice guy. You know, he's so nice, which, I mean, he might be the nicest guy in the world. I'm not saying nothing bad about him, but you don't win football games. And he went to Miami, he showed you again, he don't win football games. So, you know, and they got the coach they got now, he, he's he's decent, but, you know, he, he got him to the national titles first year, but he ain't going to do nothing else. They, they don't do nothing with the town. They always have like the top recruiting class and they can't do anything with it. Wow. So, I mean, to me, that's a coaching problem. Yeah. Right, I can't can't argue with that and stuff. They're, so. they're on the top recruiting <laughs> class every year, for years, and and you can't do nothing with it. Right. So, well, Alan, this has been so much fun. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've learned so much, not only about you, but a lot of things you know about the inner workings and uh, you know during the late eight nineties, early two thousands, stuff like that. I just. Can't say enough how, how awesome it's been to t chat with you for the last uh, hour plus. And I thank you for all your time. And uh, definitely somewhere down the line, stars come in place. I would love to have you back on. Hey, listen, I'm going to send you a picture. So you need to DM me or you got me in my address. Uh, yeah. I'll send you a picture. I want to see it up on that wall next time I watch your podcast. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> if, you want, I, um, if you want, I'll, uh, I can email you my, uh, my address and stuff, and uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm not going to turn down a, a free autograph from Mal and Funk. Yeah, man, D send that to me, man. I'll get it out to you. All right, I'll do that as soon as we uh, as soon as uh, we get off here. All right, bro. I appreciate you having me, man. I had fun, man. I appreciate it. Uh, anytime, man. Thank you so much. All right, bud. Wrestling fans, Steve and I here, one half the commentary team of Chicago Land Championship Wrestling, also the general manager of Chicago Style Wrestling, and you are listening to What Do You Say with DDJ. Thank you, Alan, for uh, the great interview. It was so much fun, and I 
got to learn so many cool things that I had no idea and uh, really enjoyed you telling your story. And I hope uh, those of you who will listen to this enjoy it as well, too. Um, be sure to check out uh, Alan Funk's group, uh, the uh, Multicontinental Wrestling Alliance at uh, Pro Wrestling. Uh, you can check them out on uh, ProWrestlingTees.com and get yourself an MWA shirt at ProWrestlingTees.com slash MWA World. Uh, follow the show on uh, their Twitch channel at Twitch.tv slash MWA World. Uh, be sure to join their Facebook group on uh, Facebook. Uh, just type in MWA or Multi-Continental Wrestling Alliance. Uh, they have a Facebook page on there as well, too, uh, at MWA, facebook.com slash MWA World, one, the number one. Uh, they're also on Instagram at instagram.com slash MWA World. They're on Twitter at twitter.com slash MWA World. And you can also check them out on YouTube at youtube.com slash C slash Multi-Continental Wrestling Alliance. Uh, before I uh, call it a day here, I want to give a special thank you to some very good friends of mine who have really helped me through some uh, rough times these past few days. Uh, I want to give a special shout out to uh, my boys at Such Good Shoot, uh, Shane Green, Isaac Gresser, and Steven Dozer. You guys have helped me out in ways I don't even think you understand, and I can't fully thank you enough for the support and your continued friendship through these trying times. Um, I'd also like to thank some uh, very good friends of mine who I recently just reestablished some friendships with. That'd be my friend uh, William, my friend China, my friend Charlie, and the rest of the guys of the uh, Pro Wrestling Tees uh, VIP uh, Merch Freak uh, chat group that I am a uh, part of. You guys are the best. I thank you for uh, sticking with me and I uh, love you guys. Uh, as always, I'd like to thank my wife for supporting, letting, allowing me to uh, do this podcast and my son for being the coolest kid ever. And to everybody out there who's taken a ch time to listen to one episode of my show, listen all 40, well now 42, and just everything that I've ever been involved with, I thank you all for the support. Uh, once again, I want to thank uh, John Scott of the uh, Johnners Wrestling Podcast Net Wrestling Podcast Network for allowing me, bringing me on board, and to thank my very good friend John Bullard uh, for hooking me up with that meeting. Well, that's all the time I have this week for uh, this episode of What Do You Say with DDJ. Uh, thanks for listening, and be sure to uh, come back in about a week with another episode of What Do You Say with DDJ, now part of the Johnners Podcasting Network. <laughs>